Welcome to Percival Baptist Church. Let's stand to our feet and just worship the Lord together.
guys excited for Christmas? Amen. I know I am. You know, this Christmas, and really every Christmas, what we want to do is exalt the name of Jesus and, and really keep him the main thing. Just remind our hearts of what we're celebrating. We want to celebrate the fact that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus came down to do the thing that we couldn't do, to live a perfect life, to be the sacrifice for our sins. So we're going to sing uh, a little bit of a different version of an old favorite, Away in a Manger, that just, that really exalts the Lord Jesus. So let's sing it together. desire in our hearts is that you would receive the glory, you alone, forever and ever. Lord, you are the one who reigns on the throne of heaven. You are the one who is worthy to open the scroll. Lord, you are the, the God of creation from before the world even you loved us enough to step down into this broken earth that you made to love us in the pit of our sin and death and you ransomed us from that fate thank you Lord for all that you have done we love you we exalt you in Jesus name amen y'all may be seated
morning, First of All Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Kurt, and can you believe Christmas is only five days away? Christmas is always an exciting time every year, and this year is not going to be any different. It's the time during second service for the elementary age kids to head to the back of the sanctuary to meet their leader. Isn't it great to see so many young kids worshiping with us each week and hearing their voices alongside of ours? You know, this year has brought many changes to our worship time. And whether you're joining us in person or joining us online, it's great just to be together. If you're with us in person this morning, we would love to meet you. Just stop by guest services in the back corner of our sanctuary. We have a gift for you we would love to give to you. If you're watching us online, text the word WELCOME to 540-277-9505 and hit SEND and then follow the prompts. This will give us a chance to connect with you after the services. Another great way for you to connect with us is through prayer. If you have any prayer requests or any needs, text pray for me to the same number. Hit send and follow the prompts. We have people in our prayer room who will pray for your need as soon as they get it. And our elders pray over all prayer requests every Monday morning. Now for the exciting news. Our Christmas Eve services are just days away. And this is always the highlight to our year as we get to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Because this year has been so different, we're having to limit our service sizes. So we were asking you to pre-register at perbat.org. To date, we've had such a great response to our services that we've had to add more. On Wednesday, December 23rd, we will now have two services at 4.30 and 6 p.m. And on Thursday, December 24th, you can join us at 3 o'clock or 6 o'clock because our 4.30 services are full. We hope you will invite your neighbor and friends to join us. Our goal here at PBC is to help you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. As we look forward to starting a great new year, we get to know God better as we spend time talking with Him through prayer. We're inviting you to join us as we start our 21 days of prayer on January 3rd. Did you know you were made for 21? It's designed to help you seek what God has planned for you personally, but also help us corporately find out what God wants us to do for this community. One of the best ways to know God better is to read what he has told us about him in his word. So we're inviting you to join us as well as we read through the Bible in a year. You can get the link to download the YouVersion Bible app at perbap.org. There will also be a link to purchase the one-year Bible if you prefer a hard copy at perbap.org as well. I hope you are as excited to celebrate Christmas with us this year. Let's prepare for Pastor Corey's message and keep each other safe by raising our mask. Here we go. Hey, that was better than first service. You win, all right? Good morning. So glad you're here. A quick update. Um, after we made that video, uh, more people registered for Christmas Eve. And uh, so now they kind of put a little red strike through on there to try to make it clear for you. Um, out of the five services that we're having on the 23rd and the 24th, there's only two that are open. So um, we have filled up on the 23rd, we've filled up 6 p.m. And on the 24th, we've filled up 4.30 and 6 p.m. Isn't that an awesome problem to have? That's so cool this year. So um, we are adding as many as we can. So uh, the ones that are open are on the 23rd at 4.30. There's still about half of the room in that service. And on the 24th at 3, there's still about half of the room in that service. So you go to perbap.org slash Christmas. It'll give you a link there where you can go and pre-register. But have no fear, if you're watching us online or if you're here and you're planning to watch us online, we're going to be uh, live streaming uh, all of our Christmas Eve services. So whether you're there, whether you're here, no matter what, we want you to join us for Christmas Eve. Hopefully you'll set aside time. You don't have to pre-register, by the way, if you're watching from home. We trust that you've got a, a seat for yourself on the couch, okay? So you don't have to do that. Uh, we're trying to make sure we have enough seats here for everybody who wants to come. Have you ever discovered how um, two people can look at the same event or the same thing and come away with two completely different perspectives? Have you ever noticed that in your life? If you have been married for one minute, you have learned that reality. That two people can observe the same event 
and somehow come up with a different conclusion. I'm trying to convince my wife it's not possible. She insists that it is. If you are a human of any kind, you know that's true. Let me illustrate it for you a little bit. I'm going to show you five different ambiguous images. That's what they're called. And uh, they go from like easiest to hardest and see if you can come up with two different conclusions just from these pictures. Here's the first one. It's the most simple. You look at this one. This is a very famous one, isn't it? How many of you right off the bat see two faces looking at one another? That's the first thing you see. That's the first thing I see as well. Uh, but you can pretty easily kind of flip your mind and see the vase. How many of you see the vase in the middle or the candlestick holder thing? That's the official name. I'm a man. I don't know what they're called. Um, but you look up there. You can, how many of you can kind of see both of them? Can you see both of them? You can figure it out. All right. Here's another one that's a little bit more difficult. You see that one? Okay, by show of hands, how many of you see a bird right off the bat? Okay, most of you. How many of you see a rabbit? Pretty good. Okay, very good. So if, if you don't see it, the bird faces to the left and the rabbit faces to the right. Can you see both of them now? That, that one's not too bad. Here's another one that's really famous. You're probably familiar with this one. You've seen it before. And uh, I want to be careful as a man here and how I label these two women in the picture. <laughs> Uh, but there's one less experienced, let's just call it, younger lady looking away. How many of you see the younger lady right off the bat? I think most people see that one. Does anybody see the more experienced lady? Yeah? That's a better term, isn't it? Okay, if you don't see it, um, how many of you think we're absolutely crazy for seeing an older lady in there? Yeah. You can't see it at all, right? Well, let me try to explain it to you. I can't, I can't obviously touch the screens. Um, most people, I think, see the younger lady and they miss the older one. So if you see the younger lady, her jawline is the older lady's nose. Do you see that? And uh, the younger lady's neckline, that black line on her neck, is the older lady's mouth and her chin. Un ah, you see it now. Do you see it? If not, go home and Google it. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll see it eventually. Squint your eyes, put some tinfoil hat on or something. You'll figure it out. All right, here's another one. See if you remember this one. Do you remember this picture? This floating around and caused marital strife and family discord. Evidently, people see two different things in this picture. It is a shoe. <laughs> we all see that. But they see two different colors. All right, other than the turquoise aqua color, whatever that is, how many of you see and think that this shoe is gray? Okay. I think it's gray. How, there is another option. You're like, what? it's gray. Isn't this black and white? No, it's, it's, how many of you see pink? Mo oh my goodness. I am in the minority here. This, this makes me feel so weird because colors are colors, man. Like you people are wrong. Okay. That's a gray shoe. All right. That is a gray shoe. All right, here's another one. Um, here is one that's maybe even more infamous. Do you remember the dress? This was like a year and a half ago. This floated around on everybody's uh, feeds. And um, it became so popular that manufacturers and clothing makers actually made copies of this because, like, women wanted to wear it, all right? Okay, evidently there are two different ways that you can see this dress. All right, by show of hands. How many people see a white and gold dress? Yes, that's the godly people in the room. Okay. How many of you see a blue and black dress? <laughs> Is that not the weirdest thing? It's just like colors are colors. I showed this picture to my seven-year-old son, and I said, that is a white and gold dress. And he said, no, it's blue and black. I said, no, it's white and gold. And my seven-year-old looked at me, not respectfully. And he said, dead seriously, he said, Dad, you need to get your eyes checked. Like that's, <laughs> You've got a problem, okay? It is possible somehow, I don't really understand the science behind this or what's wrong, okay? But somehow, two people can look at the same thing and come away with two completely different conclusions. Doesn't this help your marriage? It's just like, it's possible, Okay. All right, you got to come to center on this and uh, come to a compromise. All right, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. 
So I know we need to offer relational counseling or something after this one. There's many people in turmoil after this. We apologize for ruining your Christmas. Matthew chapter 2. We're going to talk about a story um, where this exact same thing happens. All right? Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read the whole story, and then we'll go back and talk about it, okay? Matthew 2 verse 1 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. Verse 6, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7 says, "Then then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their gifts, they offered Opening their treasure, treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. God, as we open up your word, I pray that you'd use us to change us. I pray that you would be the surgeon, we would be the patients, and you would get to work where we need work. We're listening to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Every story has one plot. And it has characters. And this story is no different. There's two main characters in this story, and there's one main event. Here's the main event. A Savior arrives, and God uses light to draw people to him. A Savior arrives, and God uses light to draw people to him. I want you to take a look at what the wise men said there in verse 2. Their question was this, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? And then read the yellow with me. For we saw, what? His star when it rose and have come to worship him. You know, on a clear, dark night, far away from city lights, you can see approximately 2,000 stars. I counted them. (laughs) No, I didn't. I didn't count them. But somebody on uh, Google said there was 2,000 stars that you could see, so I'm going to trust it because the Internet's never wrong, right? You can see 2,000 stars. None of those stars, these wise men, were drawn to. None of those stars, as they have observed the heavens, as their astrologers, had they ever packed up their bags, traveled across a desert to try to go and find. Not one of them, and that verse tells us why. Because they saw a new star. And for all of creation, when anything is created, not just in the heavens, but in a store, in a grocery store, or at home, or in a carpenter's shop, or in a welder's place, when anything is created, you automatically assume someone made it. And so when these wise men look up in the heavens and there's a new star, they say, oh look, his star. They assume someone put that star there. So it drew them in a way that none of the others did. None of the other 2,000 stars that they had seen had drawn them that way. And called the wise men out of the darkness to come towards the light. In fact, we put a, a very tiny star on top of our church building for this very reason. So that every time you drive by it, it reminds you of this story of people who saw the star and wanted to come get close to Jesus. That's our prayer for you. Every time you see it, that it would remind you to come to Jesus and get close to him like the wise men. 
Well, this story and this one main event actually reminds me of something Jesus would say later in his life because this very same way that God used the light to draw the wise men, I believe, is the way that he still works today. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 8. I believe these verses will illuminate this for us a little bit. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John chapter 12, Jesus would go on to say, And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Doesn't that sound exactly like what happened with the wise men? Jesus says, I'm going to be the light, and I'm going to draw people to myself. I love how those verses offer affirmative, clear, bold statements. They're not wishes, they are demands, they are commands and statements of truth. He says, I am not one of the lights of the world. I'm not one of the options. I am the light of the world. Isn't that good? He says, and it, there's a promise here. He says, if you'll follow me, you will not walk in darkness, but will have light. And he says, I am lifted up and I will draw people to myself. Jesus it wasn't wishing and hoping. He was promising and praise God, I believe 2,000 years later, he is still doing this, isn't he? He's still drawing people out of darkness and into the light. There are 2,000 other distracting things out there, but none of them draw like Jesus does. None of them have the impact that our Savior does. How many of you grew up out in the country where a night sky looks totally different than it does in the city? Any of you grow up in a place like that? If you've never seen that, you're missing out. It is angelic in its own way. It's beautiful. It looks totally different. And when you get out there, it's so dark. It's complete darkness that the brilliance of the stars shines brightest. Crowded out by the noise of city lights, you won't see that same brilliance. But when there's more darkness, lights shine brighter. I know 2020, for many people, has been a dark year. And as we've been preaching about peace, it's my prayer that in the midst of this dark year, that the light of Jesus, the peace he offers, and the salvation from our sin and brokenness in this world, would, would, that many would see it and be drawn like the wise men. It's my prayer that family members that we've thought were long gone would be drawn by the light of Jesus in the midst of this darkness. It's my prayer that neighbors that we never imagined would show up as they're drawn to Jesus, that strangers would come out of nowhere, that sinners that we had labeled too far gone would travel and come to Jesus. Do you believe that God can still draw people to Jesus today? I believe he's still the light in the darkness just like this story. And it has application for us here. If he can draw wise men through a desert to come see a baby, I believe what he says when he says he can draw all people to himself too. So there's one main event. A Savior arrives and God uses light to draw people to him. He did it then and he still does it today. So we are still experiencing this one main event. We're spiritually living the story of the star today. Well, there's not just one main event. There are two main characters. We have Herod and we have the wise men. History knows Herod as Herod the Great. And in the wise men, you may have heard them called other things. Maybe you've heard them called the Magi. You heard that? Or maybe you've even heard them called kings. We'll talk about that in a minute and why they were called that. But these are the main two characters in the story. Both become aware that a Savior has been born, that a King has come. But like those ambiguous pictures we looked at at the beginning, they have very different responses. They respond, I think, like many people do today. Here's the first one. We have Herod. Did you notice that the, what the wise men said and how Herod responded? The wise men came and they asked this question in verse 2. Read the yellow with me. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And then Herod gathers the chief priests and the scribes and he's asking them a question. And in verse 4, here's what he asks them. Read the yellow. He said, he, Herod, inquired of them where the Christ 
was to be born. Where the Christ was to be born, the wise men said nothing of the Christ. They said nothing of a Messiah. They simply noted that a king had been born. Have you learned this clever parenting tactic, or have you ever had this tactic used on you, where a parent asks a vague, open-ended question to see what kind of details they can get out of their kids? Have you tried this? It is brilliant if you've never tried this. And I only learned it because my parents did it to me all the time. Is they would ask vague, open-ended questions like, do you want to explain to me what happened in there? Did you, have you ever asked that question? It's scary because you don't know what they know. And you've got a decision to make. Am I going to reveal it all or am I just going to risk it? You know? <laughs> And, and, and it's a great tactic because oftentimes you'll get more than you had before. And you parents, you got to act like you already knew, right? You just keep them on their toes a little bit. Well, Herod responds to a question he wasn't asked. Did you see that? He was triggered, not by something on the outside, but by some innate knowledge or some need on the inside. Something he personally knew became public. How did he know that the king the wise men spoke of might be the Christ? How did he make that connection? Well, Herod may have worked for the Roman government. He may have done their bidding, but he had been raised a Jewish boy, meaning that he had been taught the prophecies, he would have known the Torah, he would have been taught the law and all of its ins and outs, and so he had a hunch. He called the chief priests and the scribes together to confirm if his suspicion was true, to see if what he thought was happening is what really was happening. And when he found out that this possibly was who he thought it might be, he's triggered. Have you noticed that people have no problem if you mention God? Have you noticed that in, in our world and in your families and in your workplace? There's not as, as stiff of a response when you talk about God generically. Have you, have you experienced this? In fact, in our world where they seem to be very against uh, Christians and things like that, there's one phrase that kind of surprises me, and I don't want to give them any ideas, but uh, one nation under God, I would have expected that to have gotten a whole lot more aggression by now than it has. And the reason I believe it hasn't is because people don't have a problem when you use the name God in today's climate. But if you bring up the name of Jesus, what happens? It's the cross is offensive. The name of Jesus will trigger people. If you identify with Jesus and if you have experienced this in your family, people have no problem if you generically talk about God. But if you insert that there is possibly the need for a Savior, a Jesus out there, you will get a different response. And if you haven't, you're probably not talking about Jesus enough. We, we experience this, and this is exactly what's happening in this story. Herod grew up with God in the picture. That wasn't foreign to him. He knew about this. But here's what he does when he's confronted with Christ. He pretends to worship from afar. Look at verse 8. He said, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Did Herod have any intention of going and worshiping this child? None whatsoever. Bethlehem is merely five miles away, but Herod doesn't go. You would think if he was really interested if he really wanted to know about this baby that they're asking about, he would make the one and a half hour walk to go see for himself. That's not far in that day and age, but he doesn't. And, and did you notice who else doesn't make that walk? The chief priests and the scribes don't either. They stay there with Herod. These are supposedly the people who for their entire lives and livelihoods have been looking for the promised Messiah, but when the opportunity, even lining up with prophecy and Scripture, shows up, they don't go. Because your priorities can get out of whack pretty quickly whenever they were trying to please Herod more than the Lord. You know, when something threatens me, I go and take a closer look. When there is a noise in the night in our house, I go and search it out. 
I'm kind of neurotic about it, actually. I will search every nook and cranny of my home until I either find the thing that fell off in the pantry or discover there is nothing to be worried about. I'll search places that a human being can't even fit. I will go and search it out because if, if there's something that might threaten me or my family, I'll go to the, 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 the greatest extent to ensure that it's not. Well, Herod refuses to go. And did you notice what he does? He requires that they come and report back to him. You know, it's common practice for skeptics to require proof from a distance rather than before they believe, before they get too close themselves. Because the concern is if they got too close, they may find something that they don't want to see. I told a story a few weeks ago from the book, The Unexpected Journey about an atheist who had mocked Jesus from a distance. She had made fun of him, and she had even read parts of Scripture in order to try to pick the argument apart. And She would academically debate people who were Christians, and she would antagonize and be aggressive towards them and make fun of them. But the thing that changed for her is when she read about Jesus. When she got close to him, it changed her heart, and she saw the key that made it all make sense that this Savior had come for her. But as long as she observed from a distance, there was no change. Jesus was talking about this one time in John chapter 5. He said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But you don't realize this. He's saying, it is they that bear witness about me. The Bible is about Jesus. He says, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Herod and the scribes and the chief priests knew the scriptures. Do you notice how quickly the chief priests answered when he said, where is the Messiah or the Christ supposed to be born? They immediately rattle off the prophecy verbatim, word for, for word. They knew the scriptures, but they demanded proof from afar. If you're here today and you are a skeptic or you're watching online and you're a skeptic, I want you to know criticizing from a distance isn't going to get you very far. The only way to find out if what you're criticizing is true or not is to get proximate, to get close, to come and get your own microscope, get your own magnifying glass, and take a close look at Jesus. I promise you, you're going to find something you didn't expect. And if you're a believer here today, Matthew chapter 5 actually flips this story a little bit for us in that we're not really the wise men or Herod as much as we are the star. Jesus is the light of the world and he says the light is living inside of us and so we are lights in the world. And what does the star do? It doesn't debate academically. It just takes them to Jesus. That's our job. It's not to debate. It's not to fight. It's just to take people to go and see Jesus and let God do what he can do. I've never argued anybody into heaven. But when they've come and taken a close look at Jesus, you, you'll see a change that you can't bring about in your own intellect and your own arguments. Herod stayed put. And from a distance, he didn't just criticize, he plotted. And in Matthew chapter 2, later in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, because remember, they didn't come back the way he had asked them to, that he became furious. And he sent, and, and look how radical he becomes. He killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. He went from being a critic to being an aggressor. Do you see that in our world today? Where people go from criticizing from a distance and wanting just for things to be separate to actually going on the offensive. Herod was so troubled personally. He's so motivated because his entire life has been centered on growing and maintaining control. Herod had been placed in his position, if you like history, by none other than the famous Roman leader Mark Antony. Mark Antony put Herod into his position. He would ruthlessly rule for 36 years, very long in that time. And the way that he did it is he got married no less than nine times just for political gain. 
He would marry to annex and marry to annex and marry to annex. And if there was a threat to his throne, he would take drastic action. He killed at least uh, one of his wives, two of her brothers, and two of his own sons when he got a sniff that they might be challenging his throne. Not to mention an entire generation of boys in one region just to maintain control. Herod was a man accustomed to calling his own shots and getting his own way. And I believe, I really believe that Herod is simply a representation of many people's response today. Criticized from afar, become aggressors all to maintain a semblance of personal control. You're going to see this if you fast forward into Jesus' life in the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Romans. They would all react the exact same way as Herod did to Jesus' life. They sought for ways to get rid of him so that they wouldn't have to deal with him. And ultimately, they succeeded in doing what Herod couldn't. Physically, they killed him. And it's the same response of many today. Our culture seems to want to eradicate anything that has to do with Jesus. And while they can't physically kill him, they'll try to kill any mention of him. And Why is that? Is it because they're so evil that we need to go out there and fight them at their own battle? No. It's because they've not taken a close personal look at Jesus. Our job, our remedy isn't fighting with the weapons that they use. We need to realize there's been Herods for thousands of years. And I have to tell you as a pastor, when I see people respond to Jesus this way, in some way it actually just confirms for me that Jesus is who he said he was going to be. He is what he purported to be. And when they respond that way, it makes me love him more. Because what do you expect? It is a challenge to people's personal control. And this is how they react. So we have one main event. A Savior arrives. God uses light to draw people to him. And we have two main characters. Herod, and we see how he responded. Then we have the wise men. You may call them the magi. These men were studiers or students of the stars, and they immediately noticed a shift in the constellations. They were the astrologers of their day. They were learned men. They were scientists. And a trick question for you Bible scholars out there, you can drop some good Christmas Bible knowledge on your family later this week. How many wise men were there? You, see, I told you it was a trick question, so you were wise not to answer. See, you're the wise men and women. Um, here's the answer. There's three gifts, and the word wise men it means plural, but we don't know exactly how many wise men there were. All right, So go drop that knowledge on your family this week. You can be proud. All right, These wise men experience the exact same main event as Herod, but their response, like those pictures we looked at earlier, is quite different. When Herod stayed put, the wise men traveled from a distance. It says the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. We don't know exactly how far the wise men traveled, but the closest civilization east of Jerusalem is probably hundreds of miles away. So Herod, you'll remember, wouldn't go five miles. The wise men came hundreds. They didn't stay there either. When they got pretty close, they went to see for themselves. Verse 9 said, after listening to the king, they went on their way. They weren't satisfied until they got to Jesus. Very different response. And when they got there, look what happened. It says they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It says they worshipped him and they opened their treasures. I love this, uh, exceeding with great joy. That doesn't sound like the sitting on hands worship that I grew up experiencing. That, that sounds like cheering. It sounds like loud singing. It sounds like joy. It sounds like heaven. These people had a different response than Herod. It says they worshiped. It was almost like a knee-jerk response that when you take a close look at the Savior of the world, you can't help but cheer and have joy and worship. And you, you think about this. These rich men opened their treasures. Who would force somebody to do that? Only the Savior of the world could compel someone to willingly say, what's mine is actually all yours. This is their response to the Christ. 
Laying eyes on him brought out worship. It brought out generosity. And I don't know what you're feeling this Christmas season or how this year has been for you personally, but I want you to notice what impacted the wise men. After a long journey, distraction, and turmoil, what, what impacted them was coming face to face with the Savior of the world that elicited the joy that maybe you're looking for, that elicited the honest and authentic worship that just rose out of their hearts, the generosity that we all commend them for and give gifts at Christmas as a kind of a remembrance of. This, this has such an impact on us today, and we all look at that with commendation, and, and it all came by taking a close look at the Savior. If this has been a journey of a year for you, the prescription is the same. Come to Jesus and take a close look and he'll do the rest. Herod grumbled and plotted how to destroy Jesus and the wise men worshipped with joy and gave their treasures to him. How can the same main event elicit such different responses from the main two characters? Well, we actually got a hint. In the very first question that the wise men asked when they got to Jerusalem, they said this, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For King Herod, that was a terrifying question. He was the king and nobody else. That that would have rocked his world. The suggestion, the inference that maybe somebody else was actually the king. And for the wise men, they actually had a different response. Some people called them wise men or magi, but like we said earlier, some people call them kings. Where did they get that? Well, it's not out of a translation of Matthew chapter 2. It's actually from a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, and look at the words. It'll kind of give you a, a, a picture of what happened with the wise men. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And it says, and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. It says, a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. And then look what it says. They're going to bring gold and frankincense. That's just two. I know what you're thinking, but wait, there's myrrh. I know. That's a terrible joke. If you didn't get it, go back and watch it later. They over-delivered. you got to give them credit for that. We'll talk about why in a minute. They're going to bring gold and frankincense. Doesn't that sound exactly, that's so specific, this prophecy. And she'll bring good news, the praises of the Lord. They're going to come and worship. See, our wise men weren't just astrologers. They were in their own right kings. Like Herod, they saw a new king being born and they had a choice to make. And I believe it's the same for us today. There is a king. Are we going to recognize him as our king or are we going to fight him? The main event centered on a baby, but it wasn't a baby that threatened these kings. I've never felt threatened by a baby. It wasn't his size, his possession, his age, or his physical earthly power. It was his identity as king. That's what threatened these men. You fast forward to the end of the Bible, and it's not just his identity in the first century. I want you to know it will be his identity forever. In Revelation, it's describing Jesus in heaven, and it says this in Revelation 19. On his robe, you read his names with me, and on his thigh, he has a name written. And what is it? King of kings and Lord of lords. It was his identity for the wise men and for Herod. It's his identity for all eternity, and it's, praise God, his identity today. And the same main event has happened for us Light has shown up in the darkness. The king has arrived. And there is a question, just like for Herod and the wise men for us, who is the king? I find that everybody wants to be their own king. One famous quote that you may be familiar with is, I am master of my own fate, captain of my own destiny. It's a good sentiment for taking personal responsibility, but we aren't. Kings. There is a king of kings out there, and you have to decide how to respond to that. 
How you respond has implications for eternity. And I believe for your today. How will you respond? Not just one day when you were a child, not just one day maybe I'll come later, but how will you respond today? Will you watch from a distance like Herod? Or will you get close like the wise men? Will you grumble and complain? Or will you worship? Will you attack or will you give him your treasure? I want to leave you with this thought before we pray. We've been talking about peace this whole Christmas season. Peace because so many people so desperately need it. Let me ask you, as we look at this story and the two main characters, which of them had peace? Herod was troubled and flailing. He was grasping and trying to maintain control, and it was spinning out of control in his life. Or the wise men who were steady after their own long, hard journey. They were generous, and they were worshipful. I want you to know your daily peace is determined by who is your king. When I'm the king of my own life, I'm anxious. When I recognize him as king, not just over all of heaven, but of my heart and of my life, I'm at peace. So is he your king this season? Father, we're coming to you, and we want to recognize you. We want to worship you, not as a baby, but as our king. The one over heaven and earth, the one over all of creation, and the king over our lives. You are king of kings and Lord of lords. Father, I pray if there is any area of our hearts that we need to surrender to you, our king, that we would do it now. Whatever it is that is making us anxious, we would surrender to you, our king. I pray, Father, we would recognize you as the one to direct our lives the one who is in ownership of all we have and in direction over our path and our future. You are our king. And help us to respond like the wise men with worship, exalting you as the king that you are, being generous to open our treasures. They're really yours to give to you. If you're here today and you're not a believer, I want you to know he wants to be your king. He wants to be your savior. He didn't just come as a baby. He he grew physically into a man who would die on a cross, living a perfect life and dying on a cross for you, to be the king over all eternity for you, to call you to himself so that you can be saved. The scripture is clear. We need to repent of our sin, the thing that separated us from God, and turn back to him, confessing Jesus is Lord, he's king over our lives. Believe that he died on the cross and rose again to conquer death and hell for us. And if you want to make that decision today, he says he draws men to himself. If you are being drawn by the Holy Spirit now, and you want to respond to him today, turning from your sin, calling him your King, your Savior. You can pray in your own words. He's listening. God, I repent. I turn back to you. I confess that Jesus is Lord. He is my King. I believe that he died on the cross and rose again. Come into my life and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've made that decision today or or you're at home and you've made that decision, we'd love to know. You can text the word decision to us. We're going to follow up with you. Or if you want to be baptized to declare to everyone who your king is, do the same. And we want to walk with you. Um, We're going to have the opportunity to celebrate one of those today. Every Sunday we take communion at PBC. And that third gift that the wise men brought that wasn't in Isaiah 60 is probably the most telling. They brought myrrh, which was an oil for embalming, symbolizing the dead. It's an interesting gift to give a baby. But it wasn't for the baby. It was to point to who that baby was, the Savior of the world who was going to die on a cross willingly after living a perfect life for us. 
And so as you take communion today, I want you to reflect on the fact that the moment, actually from the beginning of creation, this was the plan. The Christmas story about sending the baby wasn't just for the baby, it was for the cross. It was for the empty tomb. And so as you take communion, you reflect on that gift that was given, not just to him, but to us. As Jesus died on the cross for us, his body broken and his blood spilled, as you take the bread and the juice, you remember that. You take communion whenever you are ready, and then in a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to worship our King together.
It's good to worship our King, isn't it? Can we just sing this together? baptisms if y'all have a seat. We have one more thing we wanted to do before we go. Um, before we do that, I wanted to remind you, next Sunday, the 27th, we are going to have a, uh, a uh, normal services that morning. We're going to have our same two services, uh, but one thing that will be different is we're going to have family services. So we won't have preschool, we won't have elementary. We're going to give our volunteers a break, and uh, we're all going to be here worshiping together, so we hopefully, hopefully you will join us. A few weeks ago, you had a chance uh, to confirm new elders for our church. Scripture tells us uh, that elders, uh, we believe, are the shepherds and overseers of our body. And as a church, the way that that works uh, here at PVC is that they're nominated from within the body, and then they go through a vetting process, and then they are confirmed by a vote of our members. And we just did that a few weeks ago. And so those elders will come and they will serve up to a six-year term. And uh, I just want you to know, as a pastor, you have great elders as shepherds and overseers of our church. If you are an elder here or you have ever been an elder at our church, would you stand? And we just want to thank you for volunteering and serving in our church. Thank you for leading us so selflessly. Some of them are in the back as we are here to um, pray over and commission four new elders. Two of them are brand new. Two of them have served before. So um, with uh, George Fletcher, who's a glutton for punishment, he's going for his third term as elder. Come on up. We have Joel Hookthausen. We have Alan Garman, both of them serving for the first time. And then we have uh, Steve Rumitz, who is serving for a second time. If you guys would come on up, and then I'm going to turn things over here in just a moment to the chairman of our elders. While he's doing that, Alan, let me grab that from you. We're going to give them, we're giving them this um, kind of token to help them remember what we believe Scripture tells elders to do. There are these symbols in there. There's a sheep in there because first and foremost, they're not shepherds, they're sheep. We are sheep who follow the great shepherd. And so we are to be sheep first as elders. There's praying hands. I get to pray with these men every Monday morning at 6 a.m. for you. And uh, no greater honor than we have than to approach the throne of God for you and on your behalf and for this church. And then right in the middle, because we want to be founded and anchored on God's word as the picture of a Bible. That is central to all we do as a church, is rooted on and in God's word. And then there's a dove there reminding us that we are to be spirit-led. The Holy Spirit came down on Jesus when 
he was baptized like a dove. And we want to be led by his spirit, not ours. And then finally, after all of that, a shepherd's crook, we are to lead after we have done all of those things. So they're going to have these to remember their roles. I wanted to turn it over to Mark as he's going to come and commission these men. Thanks. One thing we didn't say at the first service, but when you uh, chose and elected Corey as our senior pastor, our bylaws uh, state the senior pastor is a member of our elder board. So we're actually praying over you too again, brother. So welcome. We need to get you a plaque. If you remember. Join me as I pray over these men. Ask our elders to st you stand with me. And they're going to be raising hands at a distance. Normally we'd lay on hands, but we'll just... Uh, be as close as the Spirit allows. Father, we thank you for bringing us together as the body of Christ, the church, and that your word has clearly directed us of how leadership and structure that we could join together uh, as a body, building your kingdom and serving one another in unity and in love. Thank you for raising up among us these men and their wives who are willing to work and serve Thank you for your Holy Spirit's guidance through the process in which they've been nominated, reviewed, and now voted on by our membership. Thank you for these men being willing and eager to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, his church, and his kingdom of the gospel. We now pray that you would anoint them and set them apart for the ministry as an elder at Percival Baptist Church, and that your Holy Spirit will fill and empower them, empowering Alan and George, Joel and Steve to walk humbly and totally dependent on you and you alone, Lord God. May they be ceaseless in prayer. May they be bold in proclaiming the truth of your word. May they be, they be gentle as they love and shepherd your people. May they seek to live in harmony with all May they be sympathetic to the needs of your people. May they walk humbly daily in a way that only comes by your grace. May they be quick to forgive and continually seek peace. And may they always work in the unity of Christ's body, doing nothing out of selfish ambition, but in all things considering others as better of themselves. May they, above all, love sacrificially, just as you have loved and given to each of us. And may they also just continually be filled with your spirit and wisdom as they carefully listen to you in guiding our church. Now, Lord God, you are able to do more than we could ever ask, more than we could pray, more than we could imagine. And we give you all the glory all the praise, all the honor for these, his servants, for us, his church, and in Christ Jesus now through all generations, we praise you forever and ever. Amen. Would you congratulate these men as they're commissioned to serve as elders? I want to remind you as, as you go, you have an opportunity to be just like the wise men and be generous in giving. Thank you for your generosity this year. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. We hope to see you this week or next Sunday. God bless you. You're dismissed.